Hey everyone, my name is Mike McCullough and welcome to this exclusive training session presented by Adjuster University. Today we have a special treat for you, a behind the scenes look at a group coaching call focused on mastering the claim info tab and Xactimate. This content typically is reserved for Adjuster University members only, so you're in for a treat if you're watching. In this video, we're gonna dive into practical techniques to navigate the claim info tab like a pro. Before we begin, make sure you got Xactimate downloaded on your desktop. This hands-on training opportunity will guide you in creating projects and effectively relaying information from the carrier's first notice of loss sheet. All right, so without further ado, let's jump right in and make the most of this exclusive training session brought to you by Adjuster University. Enjoy. All right, so in front of you, you should each have Xactimate in front of you right now, logged into your accounts, and what normally happens when you receive an assignment from the insurance company, that assignment is going to come into your cloud. So I want you to think of your cloud as a library. It's a library where all of your assignments go that you receive from the insurance companies using what's known <laughs> as your Xactware ID, okay? Um, your Xactware uh, information, you guys are gonna be able to find underneath this help section right here, okay? If you ever need to contact Xactware Help Desk, which is very easy to do, this is a great place to get your product key code or, and your product key code is a specific key code to your software device so that you're able to renew your subscription or get help from somebody remotely, okay? So this is the help section, very important. But we'll go back to the cloud like we were just talking about. And this is where you'll receive your assignments, again, from the insurance company using that exact where ID we just talked about. Okay. And so mine's right there. Mine's mmacula.vas.az. You can't see the whole thing, but that's what it is. And you see it the whole way down here. So you usually click that like this, right? And then after you click it right here in this little field, you then go to the right of your screen and these tools right here. And the one that you want to click is this cloud button to download. That's saying you will download this from the cloud and it will save in your local projects. So let's just pretend that that's what happened there, okay? And then anytime you're offline, after downloading it from here, the cloud, it, it goes to this local project and you're able to open it, you're able to use it and you don't need internet access to do that. Um, so. Because you guys are new and you don't have any assignments yet, what we're going to do is manually create one. <laughs> will you ever have to do this? Yes, you will. Um, I've worked for companies like uh, Brush Brush Country. Not sure if any of you ever heard of them. Um, NCC, uh, ICA. These companies, sometimes they're going to give you an assignment, and, and that assignment is not through Xactimate. Uh, it might be through a software called FileTrack, and you get all the claim information, and then you got to put it into a project. To create that project, it's rather simple. You're going to first go right up here to where it says New Project. I'm highlighting over it. You're going to click that. Now, what we're seeing here on this next window is a timestamp, a timestamp that is going to, by default, become the name of your project unless you change it to a name that you're gonna more easily remember. For the sake of this exercise, we're going to change that project name to the insured's name. Since you don't have an insured, I, I would like everybody to use their actual name today to create their project, okay? Or make, make up a name. But for this one, I'm just gonna call it the last name, underscore, and then I'm gonna say Michael, okay? If, you know, if you want to put a middle initial in there, that's fine. You don't have to. If there's, but just like that. All right. The next part on here is where you see profile. Now, you guys probably only have one or two profiles carrier, contractor, and that's it. As you can see, these are different carriers I work for, and they each have their own profile because they have specific documents, um, user preference settings and other things that like macros and company headers and opening statements that are unique 
to their company and that are sent usually or able to be transferred over somehow, like in the form of an ESX, in that profile. Okay, so in this case, we're just going to use the one that you would use if you don't have any other profiles downloaded, and that's Carrier. We're going to create that. Here we go. Okay, so now that we've used the profile carrier and given the file a name that we can find easily, we are going to not select a price list yet. We can do that later on. But it tries to have people do this because it's a step that's often missed. So it tries to get you to do it right away. But we don't have to. So we can just press X or none even, doesn't matter. All right, and here we are. So we are in the Claim Info tab. The Claim Info tab is the first thing that any of you should be completing before the other parts of your project. You should have this part complete because it is all of the policyholders' information, um, like where they live, their telephone number, um, and then it also has all of those important dates, date of loss, date that the, the project was created, the date you received it, and, fr and from that date you receive it, you get a good week before it needs to be sent back to the carrier, date contacted, usually, right, 12 to 24 hours after you receive it, and then date inspected. So we have all those dates, and it's important that we fill these out. So that's what we're gonna do today. And the first thing we're gonna go to is our insured info section. So this is under claim info, right over here. And then it's our first sub tab underneath insured info. And then there we go. These can open and close. If that makes it easier for you guys, you can do that. So you're not overwhelmed by all of it. And we'll just look at one at a time. So. Go ahead and put your name in here again. So in this case, I'm just going to say Michael McCullough. And then I'm going to put my email there. You can put a pretend email. Doesn't matter for this next step. OK. And this stuff will all appear later on. And we'll, we'll touch on that later on throughout this, this class. Underneath the dress type, this is now the next section we're in, okay? We see that we have four different categories of address types that we have to be careful to choose the right one. By default, it's going to put you on property. A lot of people want to use home for the address that the insured's at, okay? The insurance company likes for wherever you inspect the property, that that be called property. So wherever the actual inspection takes place, that's what you're putting under property address. And so in this case, I'm gonna make up an address or you can use your home address. I'm just call this one, two, three Main Street and the city, right? We'll just put your city in there. The say Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. All right. So that, that, part, that part is done right there. Um, if you get other information in your claim info notes tab or in file track, wherever you're receiving this first notice of lost document. Um, and that's what will have all the information on it that you put in here. If they if they have a mailing address where they want the check mailed or something of that nature, you know, then maybe you could put billing in there or mailing in there. Mm -hmm. You can create custom ones. You can call this mailing. Okay. And then if that one's different, then make it different, you know? If it's if it's a PO box, um, you know, 103, and it's in a different city, okay? Then that's fine. All right, so the next part we're looking at here is your latitude and longitude. These aren't particularly important unless you are um, purchasing a, um, well, they don't have Geomni anymore, but if you're purchasing an Eagle View through uh, um, Xactimate, then they are going to use the latitude and longitude that you put in there to get a more precise location of that roof that you're requesting. So that's not really important for this exercise, though. Um, this next part is going to be phone number. So here, you know, go ahead, put a, a, a fake phone number in there. 
There you go. And just so you guys can see really fast, you're thinking, well, what is what does this appear on? I can show you really fast what this appears on. All that information we just put in there, if it allows me to get here quickly, and it looks like it will. And if we preview this, okay, I'm going to pull this up, and I'm going to let you see what all that stuff that you just put in there appears on. And you can see that this is what it appears on. It appears on the PDF document that the insurance company is referencing when you create your estimate. So now you know why are we putting that stuff in there and what does it look like when it's complete? We'll go over all this stuff. This isn't important, okay? This is not stuff that we did yet. We just did. This is the only section we did yet. You can see the ones we didn't do, there's nothing there. Should be another section we're getting to. So back to the claim infos tab. And we're done with the first part, which is insured info. We're moving on to the next part, which is dates. Date of loss goes right here. Date of loss is the date that this occurrence that they are claiming happened. It's not the date of discovery. Date of discovery is the date that they uh, find it, not necessarily the date it happened. An example is a hailstorm happened in July 1st. Everybody just go ahead and put this date in there. You can use the same dates. Um, and we'll say it happened July 1st, 2022. They have a whole year to file for this hail claim. And right now we are in June and they discovered it in June. So that doesn't mean the hailstorm happened in June. The hailstorm happened in July. So keep that in mind too. These are not dates of discovery. These are dates that the storms happened. Um, and then the next part, this is the date entered. That's the date that your project was created right here, okay? Is underneath date entered. And date received, we're gonna say we got this from the insurance company today also, but maybe just you know a little bit later in the day than the time we received it. If these are not correct, it will uh, find this in its inspection audit that uh, Xactimate automatically does. And it'll tell you, hey, you might need to get these things fixed. I okay. honestly want a third voltage. Yeah. <laughs> so here we go. We're going to go to date inspected and we will just, I guess, say, yeah, we inspected it today too. Um, but, or, you know, if you, if you don't do an inspection, you'll never really hit this where it says inspection not performed. That's more of a desk adjuster thing. Somebody that doesn't go out there to the property, you're going to always go out there to the property and that's what you'll put in there. They're not too concerned about these timestamps. They're more concerned about the actual date, the, the day, not the time. Okay, so that part is done. And so you can uh, see what that looks like now. We'll go to here. And it's going to open up. Mm -hmm. And there you go. You can see. So we've done this part where we put in claim information. And now we just did this part. I suggest today. All right. Now we'll go back here. And we're moving right along. So we finished dates, we finished insured info. And the, the personnel tab, this is where you're going to put in your information. A lot of times it's gonna be different for each carrier. I can give you some examples. Some of them want you to show your email, some of them don't. Some of them want you to show your license number, some of them don't. Um, some of them want you to have the firm's number linked to your contact information, not your number. You could see anytime I get a reinspect, I get somebody else's information here. But I have, for me personally, I have one for farmers. I have one for nationwide. I have one for all state. They're 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 always changing. But here we go. You will create it. I'll show you how to create it. So if you want to create a um, a uh, you put your information in here for claim rep and estimator, which is the both of those fields that you're going to put your information in there for. All you're going to do for this part is go to add. I'm going to hit add right here, right on the right hand side. All right, add claim rep. So surprisingly, that's you. It's funny because we're out there to represent the insurance company. Sometimes they will uh, have that be the desk adjuster's information. If that's the case, it's already going to be in there. 
Even though we're not settling the claim, they still want us to put ourselves down as claim rep and estimator. So for this example, go ahead and put your name in there. Okay, and it's gonna create a quick code. You can just go with the default one, but if you got a lot of these and you want it to be particular to a certain firm or insurance company, then I recommend maybe doing it like this. Uh, you could just say this one is Allstate or Allstate MJM, or you could do, you know, farmers, uh, farmers, M, M, your initials, and then your initials. Okay, it's just, it's up to you how you want to do it, or farmers MM, because uh, they're, they're not always going to be the same exact information. Farmers might just say, and they do, Mike, all I want you to put there is your telephone number. I do not want you to give them your email. Okay, farmers, so 555-555-0000. Five, 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 zero, 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 zero. Um, click that that's your primary because that's the one it will go with by default that it shows. If you want to put down other numbers, go ahead. If you guys really want that many calls from um, contractors and from uh, public adjusters where they can get a hold of you at every number you have, by all means, go ahead. But I say give them one number. They don't get a hold of you can wait to get back with you. If you want your email to appear also, then go ahead and put that here. Now, there is few people that are asking for the adjuster's licenses now. Um, I know that Allstate is one of them. If you work for a company where they need to see your license number, I recommend doing it like this. I just put a bar there and then I go W, 406814, whatever your license number is. They don't need to see it and don't have it. But that's how I recommend doing it if they need to see what your license number is. Okay? Now, I'll go back to the original, where I call it Farmers MM or something, or MJM. It's just for me to find it easy, or I can do a little under slash. You don't have to fill out where you live, or your city, or the company or your exact amount address. You don't have to do any of that. These are really the only fields that you might have to do. And I'll just click OK. So there it is. It appeared in my long list, so I can find it easily and click OK on it. I double clicked on it, and it opened up. I'm going to go over here now, and I'm going to get rid of this one. And I'm going to, I can easily do that by, I'll do that again. I can easily remove this one and put another one in there by just clicking right here. And I'm just going to hit that, and I'm going to go to, in this search field, I'm going to type farmers, and I'm going to pick that one. All right, now we're going to be able to see in this print screen what it looks like now that we have done that. So you can see that this is a new field that is populated based on the information that we put in it. Now, when your insured gets a copy of your estimate, they're going to know how to get a hold of you. And if they want your license information, which some states require, at least it's right there. So we've now we've done the insured info tab, which is right here. We've done the dates tab, which is right here. And we've done our um, claim rep or estimator information and how to create that. All right, moving on. I'm going to close that. We're going to go back to here. And I don't want you guys to worry about going to your own print settings for right now. Um, we can we can discuss that after this recording to make if you guys have questions, something didn't populate right. But just try to stay with me and where I'm at. And so I am closing these again. This is what it looks like if they're all open. That might be what it looks like on your device. But I'm trying to make it easier for you so you're not looking at all this stuff and just closing these so that we can focus on one at a time. And we're going into mortgagees information. The mortgagees information is the mortgage company that they have. And this is oftentimes a question that we are asked to verify. And it's very important to know that they have a mortgage company because they are another insurable interest. They are somebody that needs to be involved in the claim process to make sure that they know that the house had damage and to um, make sure that the house gets repaired properly. So the insurance company will um, write a check 
with the mortgage company's name on it and with the policyholder's name on it. And then they, when the insured receives this check in the mail, they are to notify their mortgage company that they've got the check, usually mail it to their mortgage company, depending on the size of the check. And then that goes into an escrow account to make sure that the funds are used responsibly. And whatever funds are not used for the repairs, insurance is able to recoup, recoup this because they um, will have, uh, at least they will know what funds were used and the mortgage company will know what funds were used um, it, because they have access to that escrow. All right, so in this exercise, we're gonna simply just say Wells Fargo. And we're just gonna say loan number one, two, three, four, five. We're gonna do the same thing we did last time. If there's a second mortgage company or a trustee, you could put that in. Usually there's not. We're gonna to go to the print screen again. And we're gonna view where that popped, where that mortgage company's information pops up. Okay, so you, you're not gonna see it on this, which is the estimates page. However, you are going to see it on a different report that we will discuss in part four of this um, Xactimate basic training. And you're gonna see that, we'll go right to here. It's, a, um, excuse me, claim reports. And then it's under general loss report. And now we don't even have a general loss report. We're gonna be doing that in part four, but just so you can see where this populates, where you could see the mortgage company, it's right here on the general loss report. So that information, that we put into that field in our, in, in right here, that information that we put underneath the mortgagees field that is going to appear underneath our GLR, but we're not doing that again until part four. Okay, so we've now finished those sections. You're never gonna really put anything underneath loss payee um, so I'm going to open all these back up so you can just see, boom, that's what we just did. And um, something that we're not going to have anything under right now, but you might later, it's called notes. Okay. Notes is if you get a claim from Xactimate, you are going to see everything right there. Okay. Um, I guess I could kind of give you an example of what, what it might look like. Um, It might look, you know, something like, let me see if I got one of those. Okay, I'll show you what it looks like. So it's going to look something like that. So when you get a claim from Xactimate, it's going to have all this underneath this notes tab. And you can click that and you can print these and take them with you to the inspection and have all their information there. Okay. This stuff, we gotta, we're got we still gonna go over, we're not there yet, so just hang tight. We're not at that part yet, but I just wanted you to see, cause it's right, it's right here um, that this little notes tab underneath insured info is where you would go to get all that information. It's gonna tell you how the loss occurred. We can read it real quick. So what did they say for this one? Um, this one was very basic. It's just all that same information again that we saw in the claim. But they'll tell you like how the loss occurred, right? And if it was a fire and, and, and what they're claiming and if there's a public adjuster. So we are done with insured info and now we are going to our coverage and loss section. Coverage and loss section is still under claims info tab. All right, so we are still under that tab and it's just the second part. You're gonna put the claim number in here. So let's just say, all right, Claim number for this is going to be 111002. All right. And that is that that unique claim number that the insurance company puts to their file. Okay. Next part you're going to do is their policy number. If if you're working for a company that requires you to create a project, you will be able to find this information in in that claims info section. Uh, but we'll just say, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. We can just put, put random numbers in there. But I want you to put them in there so we can see what these look like uh, when we go to the print project section like we've been doing 
a few times here and, and just see um, how everything transfers into that PDF. All right, so those two are always gonna be there, claim number and policy number. Adjuster file number, you're not gonna use that. Type of loss, you are gonna use that. So type of loss, you can open that up by hitting enter or clicking right here in this little section. You can see that underneath the carrier profile that these are the different types of loss we have. I, would, I don't ever recommend creating new types of losses or anything like that. Now you should find one in here because these are your perils that are typically covered. If you're trying to put in a type of loss that isn't listed here, it's probably because it's not covered or it's under all other. <laughs> you can see here. All right, but in this case, since we're doing hurricane season, we're gonna put wind damage right there. Type of loss is not the same as the cause of loss. Um, in some cases it can be, but I'll give you an example. Um, the type of loss is water. However, the cause of loss is roof leak. You can do that, I guess, for example. Um, so you can see that water. Then you'll see, oh, we have all these other causes of loss. Bathtub, but here's roof leak. Okay. So sometimes you have to specify. You guys are able to see, we'll go back to wind. For doing wind, we don't really have to specify. Even if it's a tree, the tree's not the cause of, even if a tree hits the house, wind is still the, um, the type of loss. The tree is not going to be the cause of loss. Wind still caused the tree to hit the house, which caused the damage. So that proximate cause of loss is still gonna be wind. So next section here is cat code. So your cat code, it, if you have a big hurricane hit, they might assign a cat code and they oftentimes just look like this, something like that, 426, 165. Um, it might also be how you know if you're getting cat pay or not. Uh, I could tell you that these last couple of years, I have not seen the carriers sending me projects with the cat code in there. That's just me personally. So if you don't see it, doesn't necessarily mean it's not a catastrophe. Um, it's it doesn't necessarily mean you're not getting cat pay, um, but it sometimes is there. And so if it is great, but that's that. All right, now we're moving on to inception date and effective date. So uh, your inception date is going to be um, the first time that that policyholder uh, purchased a policy with. In this case, we'll say Allstate. So let's say that they have been with Allstate for three years. And the first time they got a policy with them, we're gonna make up this date, was on January 30th, 2022. Or excuse me, that's bad math. I wanna say 2019. All right, you will find this if you're working for companies like National Claims Connection or ICA, you will find this in their um, first notice of loss that you print off. And it will give you this information to put in here. So it is good to know. Um, and then the effective date, this is, and the expiration date. This is a period of one year when the policy began and the policy ended. So it's not your inception date. Your inception date is, again, that's when you first purchased a policy with Allstate. But your effective date is the dates in which this particular policy that you have, which is effective, um, uh, what those dates were. So we'll put for this, they usually are roughly the same uh, month and day of your inception date, but they just have different years. So in this case, we'll just, I'll click out of that. You can do it that I don't like doing it that way where I, I don't like doing it this way. Let me explain. I don't like doing it like this. It can take a little bit longer. And so what I do is I just try to make sure I enter it the proper way, which is go you know, one slash 30 slash 20, um, 23, okay? It's gonna automate, well, usually it automatically puts it in the expiration date exactly one year after, uh, but I think it's because we already had that other date there that didn't work. So it's just one slash 30, slash 20, 
24. Okay, so that's kind of what that looks like. And next we'll move to this next tab, policy type. If you have a commercial claim, you'll put commercial. But in this case, we're doing residential claims. So it's gonna be homeowner. Form numbers. You don't really have to put anything here. Form numbers, oftentimes for companies like Farmers and Nationwide, they're gonna automatically put those form numbers in there. But if you're creating your own project, and maybe you just really want that form number to be there, then I recommend you, if it's a, a residential claim, it's probably an HO3. To find the HOs, you just click HO, and you can find the one that says HO3. Where's HO3? Um, I don't know why mine doesn't have HO3, so I'm going to create that really quick. Um, yours should have HO3. Can uh, somebody verify that you guys have an HO3 there? Or I see one. Okay, for some reason mine doesn't, so I guess I'll just create it. <laughs> I searched under H instead of HO, maybe that's why. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know either, but it's probably, you know, I, I, I think it's going to, it's going to be something like that. So yeah, you should have that. I I'm surprised mine was not there again. These are typically auto populated by the insurance company. Um, but if you're creating a new project and you really want it in there and there you go. So now that we've done the loss info section under coverage and loss, we'll go to the print screen and we will view what it looks like here. Let's let's preview this and see what we got. Okay, so here we can see the type of loss, policy number, and your claim number. All right, so that's kind of what we just did. Um, you'll see here on the general loss, under the form section, that's where we should see that HO3. Huh, why don't we see it here? Well, that's because this is the old one. And so if we go right here to claim reports and we go to that general loss report. Be careful not to hit general proof of loss, man. I have done that too many times. Um, they look similar, <laughs> but okay. It should be popping up here soon. And there it is, forms, see? So there it goes, we got it in there. And you can see stuff that we don't have in there, it all says zero still, and we'll go over that. So here we go, we are gonna go back to where we were and get out of that, we're going back to claim info, coverages. And we are done with this whole section here. Um, oh, the effective dates, I wanted you guys to see where those would appear too. So let me do that again, just so you guys can see where that appears for this policy effective dates. There we go. Effective dates right there. That's really important to have those in there, especially if they're gonna deny it. Okay, back to where we were. Um, next part is apply deductible. The deductible, you're typically going to find somewhere either in the first notice of loss or in exact analysis. Okay, so here we go. I will open up exact analysis so that you guys can see maybe where I would find it on one of my claims. So we're going to bring that over. Is everybody able to see this? I, I hope everybody can. All right. So I'm going to just click on yes. one of these claims right here. And the deductible is going to appear for this claim. It's going to appear right here under claim information. And, or at least it usually does with Nationwide, uh, not this time. Um, let's go back to another, I'll go to another one here where 
it's, it's not always going to be a certain way. It, things can sometimes change, but let me see here. We'll go to James Smith, Client Policy tab. And here we go. We got all this hoopla right here. All these, like, what are we going to do with that? Well, <laughs> you can press Control F and you can search the word deductible. And there it is. That's their deductible, $1,000. So I'm, I am taking that. And as you guys can see, this is all that information that you could use to create your project if you have another system where you can get this from. Um, but we will go back. So I'm just taking that. I'm saying, hey, it's a thousand bucks. Deductible is a thousand dollars. Everybody's put a thousand in there. Um, you have across all coverages and coverage specific. Just put it on across all coverages. Um, we won't get too far down that rabbit hole of putting it under coverage specific, but let's say that you got, um, you know, you, you've maxed out your other structure coverage and they don't want the deductible to go into that or something. And you, you can then be specific about it. But the next section we're going to do here, now that that deductible section's done, is we're going to go to coverages. Coverages that usually can find, and I will show you on a typical assignment, you're going to usually be able to find these right here. This is exact analysis. This is where if you have a claim underneath your client policy info, it's going to be right there. So we can use this information to help us out. So I'm going to maybe put this onto another screen and read off of that. But now you guys know what I'm doing. And I'm simply putting, OK, there's that. And let's see. Other, do not touch these really where it says apply to RC uh, means replacement cost or ITV percentage. OK, these are things that you're not really going to mess around with, not in my history too much of of adjusting. And so we're not going to go too far into that reserves and all that stuff. Um, by default, dwelling other structures and contents are always going to appear. If there's anything scheduled or, you know, that's specific to that policy you want to add, Go ahead, you can, and we'll go over that in a second. This next one, we're just going to put other structures, which is always going to be 10% of your coverage A. So we're going to make that 33,200. Next one is contents. That, according to their policy, is 249,000. And so that's how those go in. Your dwelling coverage, your other structures and contents. If you want to add a code upgrade coverage, also known as law and ordinance, you can go right to here to where I click add options underneath your options tab to the far right of each coverage. And you would then click not sublimit, but additional coverage. So it's something in addition to, right? Go to code upgrade. And so long as it's not a really large loss, you don't have to put what the aggregate limit is um, or the single limit. Okay, so I will explain. Um, code upgrades are things that are required to be done in order for the job to be complete. So for instance, if a windstorm just occurred and you're gonna be replacing that roof and you find out after inspecting the attic that the um, deck surface is spaced cedar deck planks, which you see in homes usually that are from the 1940s and earlier. And that's where you have a half inch or greater gap between each one of your planks. And if you are using the nailing pattern to install the shingle onto the decking, and though you're not careful, those nails can go into those spaced spots causing the shingle to be easily be removed by wind. So they have enforced solid, solidly sheathed decking. And I'd say probably the best to use is OSB. Um, plywood can, can rot easily, um, but that would be a code upgrade. And so for that, I'm not going to put it an aggregate. If you do put an aggregate, it's going to be usually 10% of that coverage. So. For the sake of this, if you really want us to, 
we can and you think it's going to reach that limit then go ahead and put that in so that would be um the same as our dwelling coverage okay there we go additional amount of insurance yes okay um we're not going to go down what it means by that but basically a sublimit means that it is a part of that coverage limit so if we have a house burned down and we're adding code up uh, upgrade coverage that is not a part of that limit for how much they get so if their policy limit was three hundred and thirty two thousand dollars they get an additional 10 percent for um code upgrades also known as law and ordinance coverage and that would be an additional amount of insurance and there is no single amount examples where there is a single amount would be with trees shrubs and plants the trees shrubs and plants most policies will pay five percent so that would be whatever that is and then they will only give you a certain amount per each tree or shrub i believe it's 500 dollars or something of that nature the same applies for pre debris removal right those are limited at tree debris removal would be you know limited at 500 dollars per each uh tree that falls but but the aggregate limit the overall amount is limited at a thousand so if you had 10 trees fall well doesn't matter you're only getting a thousand dollars you're not getting five thousand dollars so that part of that is done and we get to kind of see what that looks like on our print screen so we just go here and preview that it's going to pop up and whoops i went i apologize we want to go to general loss report or statement of loss it's another section kind of see those things come in here and see what they have coverages for and it all populates right in here this is a statement of loss a lot of people are requiring a copy of these um and they get accepted by and signed and all that it helps them settle the claim okay so that's kind of how that comes in and they get a really good overview of what they have coverage for so you're able to then see what all this hard work underneath coverages did for you don't worry about these other things like flood coverage and and ad coverage and all that uh, you know it's you, you you might have to add a coverage um examples of adding a coverage might be for mold okay if you got to add a coverage for mold you can do that this way or you can do that the way we talked about right you could do it this way might be ten thousand dollars in your state or you can go right to here and you could say it's an additional coverage can add it that way okay or food for spoilage additional coverage it's just let's see there's there's sometimes multiple ways to do things but as mentioned you're really not gonna have to mess with that too much when your claims come in that information should already be there all right so we are done with the coverage and loss section and now we're moving to the parameters which is our third and final tab underneath the claim info tab automatically there's going to be a price listing that is there it is automatically computing that price listing by the address that you put here so we when we go over there we should see price listing probably from harrisburg that is current and we do how do i know it's from harrisburg well these are pretty simple to read we'll read the one that's there it says p a h a a x so it just means pennsylvania harrisburg price listing for june 2023 but um if you're having trouble getting one then you could go to request price list how did we do that i'll x out of this real quick so you can see it again we just click right here or you could press enter with this highlighted and you can search a price list if you already have it downloaded but if you do not have it downloaded then you have to request a price list okay and it's going to put a zip code there automatically but if it does not do that i'd go back and check your um, insured information in the first section we did it make sure that you have a zip code there and it's going to grab that zip code automatically if you want an older price list you can you're not going to ever really need an older price list 
um, and you're just going to hit download. It's going to do its thing. Make sure you got internet connection. You will need internet connection for this part. And there we have it. It's the same one that we just had. These price listings, they appear on the uh, estimate, also known as the final draft with or without removal and depreciation. We can see those on the cover sheet. This is our cover sheet, this whole first page. And this is an important section to look at when you have a public adjuster who is on the claim. They sometimes like to create their own price list because it's not illegal. However, it is definitely um, frowned upon. They might make this PAH8X, and we don't see an A there. Put a 9X, and then you can manipulate the price. So you got to watch out for that. And um, this part here, we see restoration, service, and remodel. That's because they do give you some options underneath the parameter section of which price list you might want. Okay, uh, but it's usually by default. So that part's really just by default. Don't worry too much about that. So we go right here next to tax jurisdiction. This usually doesn't come in automatically. And you'll, I usually just select the first one, but I select the one that is use either just the number or the one that is the percentage and capital improvements, okay? Not just for cleaning or not just for contents, okay? So next part, price list filter. Don't use that. Don't worry about that. Um, checkpoint price list will always be when the project was first created. This is checkpoint price list. It's always going to be when the project was first created, what price listing was used for that project. And if they ever want to check and see why the prices are changing, if a project keeps getting supplement after supplement, well, they use that as their checkpoint. And we'll talk more about that on another day. There you go, this next part, activity. Make sure this is set to default, but you typically just want this to be set to remove and replace. That means that there, you're writing an estimate for materials to be removed and for new materials to come in and replace the old ones. Right here, repaired by, you have the option of a homeowner. It will significantly cut down the labor cost of your estimate while keeping material costs the same. So if a homeowner tells you that they did the project themselves, they you know, cut down the tree and they fixed the fence. Well, you gotta be honest about that. You gotta reveal that in your report and probably put that to homeowner. But usually this will be contractor. New construction tab. This is really only to be hit if you have a fire loss, and you're doing a complete rebuild of the structure, which means that I'm writing an estimate for how to rebuild this place from the foundation up and demolition has already been done. And we have a lot to build the house on. That's whenever you would use and click this new construction tab. It will alter the pricing of things because it's new construction. All right. Moving on to this next part, we have add-ons. So there's a few in here that are important to know. You will want to, after selecting your price list and your tax jurisdiction, you will want to hit sales tax. Now this opens up a tab, and this is a tab that a lot of people are getting kickbacks on. So if you don't open this up and change this, the insurance company will know when they read your estimate at the very end of it, because you are applying sales tax on or you're, you're doing overhead and profit on tax, and you're doing tax on overhead and profit. And so they don't want that. They want this set to neither. They have options of, and you can do that by first selecting each individual one. You can't select them all and then do this. Doesn't work, it just does one, as you can see. You gotta go through the, I usually do the first three, because there's, there's gonna be like the first three that pertain to your estimate, cleaning, material, and cleaning material, um, storage and dry cleaning. That's not really going to relate, not unless you're doing contents. Um, and, and I will set these to neither. Again, I'm doing that for each one. They originally come in as that, okay? But we change it to neither. Don't mess with tax rate. Don't mess with any of this stuff. And just click OK. And 
I will show you where they can tell. I'll, so I will show you very quickly how they can tell if you did that part right or not with the sales tax. For the sake of this, I will just drop in one estimate or one line item, and we will just make this one a very simple one. I'll just make it masking for the sake of this. We'll just make it 10 feet of masking. All right, I just want you to see where you're able to see that. So we're just gonna go to preview, preview the estimate. If you do not uh, um, change sales tax to neither, the very end of this, where you're seeing all these things under recap by category, they're gonna know, oh, wow, he didn't do it right because these numbers don't look right, okay? So that's why we that's why we do that, okay? I will back out of that now. Hope that didn't confuse anybody too much. And we're going back to the claim info section underneath our parameters tab. So here we are, we're back there again. And we just, we're talking about sales tax. So we're done with that. And now we're gonna move to um, the include advance payment section. You're not gonna use that. Um, that would be if they already received an advance payment um, or something of that nature and the carrier wanted you to include that. You, you might want to do that, but we're not going to have to. The stuff is not important. You would add it, blah, blah, blah. So that's it for add-ons, really. That's the one add-on you really got to do is that sales tax. All right, we're going to go down to this next section, depreciation options. Um, in their guidelines, they're going to tell you how they would like you to max depreciate. Okay, so if you open up carrier guidelines, they might say usually 75%. If you're in California, it's going to be 50%. and I would keep these um, ones that are already selected here under depreciation options. I would keep those there, okay? That's th that's when the project's created under their profile, those are the ones that they automatically have selected. So don't mess with them, just keep them like that. So I'm not gonna go here, I'm not gonna select this one and select this one and depreciate, because underneath their profile that I am op creating a project under, that's their de default settings, all right. The next thing, after I, I set my max depreciation to 75%, I'm going to just keep this depreciation at recoverable. Um, if they have an ACV policy, you might want to change that to non-recoverable. Um, but if it, it, it meaning that, you know, let's say they have um, a policy with Great American, all right, they're, they like deal with a lot of your vacant homes and and stuff and then the you know uh property management company will file a claim for something um, and very careful yep um i'm sorry what was that oh okay and then so you know you might have to do um you might have to do non-recoverable but it's always going to be recoverable um and so this next one's going to usually be under age and condition not many people are depreciating by percent. And if you're depreciating by an amount, that's very, very, very rare. Okay. That might be like if there's an agreed um an, an agreed amount, like for a painting or something. That's very rare. So it's always going to be age condition. And that's going to be set at 75 because that's the standard. This will always be recoverable. All right. And so what that part does. If we go to the estimate tab, which you're gonna be learning in part two, so don't worry. But let's say that I said that, let's do another one. Let's just say for um, for some shingle, right? If I said that, you know, I had 20 squares. Okay, I'm gonna remove this one so you guys don't get confused. And I said that this roof was 40 years old. Well, what happens is, whether I say it's 40 years old or watch this 20 or 40 or 30 years old, the depreciation amount stays the same, which is right here. So whether I say it is 50 years old or a hundred years old, that amount is not going to, they're not going to temporarily depreciate or hold back from the replacement cost any more than 75%. So that's what that part does that we just did there. Okay? And it's determining depreciation by the age and the condition. 
So this next part here is overhead and profit. This is where you are going to put 10 and 10 if you believe that overhead and profit is warranted. So with this at zero, that means that we're not gonna ever see overhead and profit on the estimate. Watch how this number up here where it says grand total changes when I make it 10. So right now it says 6,692. And you can see it changed to 8,198 as soon as I put overhead and profit on it. In this case, with this being a roof, if, if it were a roof, you would not be putting over and profit on just a roof. You would need, you would put maybe putting over and a profit on interior damages. Okay. Um, overhead and profit is something we will get into. It is a long, um, complex thing, I think, to explain to new adjusters. So we'll deal with that at that point. So this insurance is unicorn insurance. So we got to go to unicorn and put their company header in there. Well, how did we get this company header here with unicorn insurance? And how did we get that to appear on this estimate? Yes, everybody, that is Charlie uh, from the YouTube channel with uh, Charlie the unicorn. Yeah, um, old videos, I think from like 2013, but it's a fake insurance company I created for the sake of this. But how did we get this here? And what do you do to do that? Well, to get a company header there, there's a few ways you can go about it. But for this one, we're going to create one. So you go to company header, you click right here, and you can see I have all these. But if you want to create one, you just go to add, and you're going to just put in, you know, you'll put in a company name. Uh, for this one, I already have a unicorn insurance, but I guess I can just, you know, call this um, Adjuster University. I don't know, something like that. Um, you could put, you know, if you want to go AU group, images, you could get images here. And we'll just copy this one over because that's the image that's there, right? You would you would get that image from your desktop. You could put it on your desktop and then it'll come right in. Again, just go to images, boom. Get other images there. If you want it to be another image of a roof, boom. Okay. But that would be the company's logo. And then here you're just gonna, you know, put wherever you, you would just put again, um, adjuster university. And then you're just going to, you know, one, two, three, Main Street. Um, and, you know, that's uh, um, and then you got, you know, whatever, five, 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 um, zero, 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 zero. Okay. That's fine. It kind of comes in like that and you just hit OK and then you can find it. You can I can I can open this up and they're going to be right in here and it's going to be whatever you whatever you called it. Um, yep, I already saw it, actually. There it is. AU group underneath code. That's how you, you see it. And then boom. So if that's what it is, well, then we go here and we can look at it and see what it looks like again. And there we go. It looks like that. And our other one looked like that. Now you know kind of how we make them. All right. And so we will just go back to where we were under parameters. Just wanted you guys to see how that looks. And now we got the opening statement section. The insurance company is going to let you know what their opening statement is. And you are typically going to find those under guidelines. Um, so I will show you guys a little example of how that kind of works. So here we're like looking at guidelines, right? Okay, so I don't wanna give any personal information or anything like that, but you can just press control F and opening statement in that guideline thing. 
let's see, statement. Here we go. Opening. Um, all right, let's try statement. And okay, so th this particular one did not have it in it, but it usually does in the very beginning. Uh, you're going to see opening statements. Usually, they're going to they're going to tell you, hey, this is what they got to look like, um, and they'll be somewhere in here. I think it's because with this carrier nationwide, um, let me close that. Their opening statements are automatically in their profile, but you know, there's you will get it in your guidelines, and then you just put it here. And so here's an example, right? And so this is what they'll kind of look like. You can see I have them for a bunch and we'll just click on one. There they go. Um, so I'll show you what you gotta do to create one though. So if you guys wanna create one, we just, again, we click right here. Let me just go to add and you can make it say anything. You know, um, you know please read, blah, 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 blah. And you, you would type all this in here. So I'll just show you for this example, I'm not going to create a whole opening statement right now. Um, we will just call this one test. There's just a bunch of hoopla there. I just write test. Under, you have to put something under model name and you gotta put some stuff here. Okay, whatever, put it in bold, whatever you wanna do. Make sure you click file, save. If you hit X or whatever, it's not gonna save it. Go to file, save and go to file, exit. There it is, it appears. Okay, now where you're gonna see that is right here again. We open up our project, our opening statement comes right here, right after the other stuff we just did, right? Which was, you know, all this. Um, and so that's why those are kind of important. And we'll go back to that section now. And for this one, I'm not going to use that one. I'm going to delete it. I don't want that on there. Um, but hey, National Claims Connection, you guys know them. We'll use this. This is their opening. Boom. And then they have their closing, which is created the same way. And we can see what these look like. There we go. Look at that. That whole thing. Make sure that you copy paste these over properly. They're very specific. So like, if you wanted to create this, you would get it in your, your guidelines. You would just select the whole thing. If you needed to add this, select the whole thing, okay? You're just gonna copy it. You're gonna just, you know, copy text. And then you would just go back there underneath your parameters and you're just gonna put it right in here. You can't just put it, you can't just go, oh, I'm just gonna put it right in here. That doesn't work. You know, you gotta hit that. You gotta go to add. Then you get a click here, then you got to hit paste. Okay. And then call it whatever you got to don't mess with it from here. That copy paste is exactly how they, they, they want it to be. Okay. And then you, you know, you would just call this ACM opening or whatever they tell you to make sure you can, you can reference it and you go to file, save file exit, but I'm not going to save this one. Cause we already have it. Okay. But <clears throat> All right, so that part is done. So we have gone through all of the claim info stuff. Uh, now, I know we're getting close to the end here. So there's one last section I wanted to touch with you guys. And that is, we're gonna save and exit here. If you are not getting a project from the cloud, it's because like, let's say if I wasn't getting a Plymouth Rock file, it's probably because I don't have their profile installed. So if you are not seeing it in the cloud, then you got to go to your dash. So this whole thing is called your dashboard. This whole page we're looking at here, okay? But you want to go to your preferences, okay, right there. General or uh, see here. And it's going to be Okay, here we go. So yeah, you got to install install new profiles. You're going to just simply reach out to Xactimate, but your profiles will appear here. Okay, so this is how you know how many profiles you have. Okay, um, if you don't have the profile and you need to get it installed, you're just going to go to help and you're going to go to live help. So 
So right here is live help. And then you're going to tell Xactimate through a live chat. Okay, you're going to tell them that you need the profile. Um, looks like they did a little bit of changes to this a little bit. Um, has a different look to it. Uh, <laughs> Xactimate desktop, you'll collect that one. Start chatting. Yeah, they did update this. It's got a new and improved look. Talking to Caden. You just tell Caden, hey, my product ID is, we want that product ID. Remember, we find that right here. Copy this whole thing. Copy. Go back to here. And I need a profile for, um, I don't know, we can make somebody up. I need a profile for Plymouth Rock. Okay, and then he will get you hooked up. Okay, guys, that's how that works. Um, and so again, if you're not seeing a project appear in your cloud and the carrier said they sent it to you, that's because you need to download their profile. Um, the last thing I wanted to hit on is under your general settings, in Xactimate, please make sure that you adjust your auto save uh, interval to every one minute. Okay, by default, it's probably gonna be on five. It might be on zero. Zero means it's never gonna auto save. So if your project crashes, you're not able to recover it. Okay, so you wanna put that to one minute. They will teach you how to recover your projects. It is pretty simple. You would just go to this tab. Uh, you're, you go to local projects. Over here, you can see that we have restore previous versions. It'll tell you if you have previous versions. So that's how you would want to do that. And the only way to recover those, where you can restore the version that crashed on you, it's called getting exactimated, is if you and your preferences had this autosave interval to somewhere between one and five minutes, I recommend one. Um, the next thing you wanna do is image quality and reports. If you guys are having issues uploading your projects into Xactimate, um, it, it might be because your images are too large, the file size is too large, so you can change that to double compression. Yes, it's gonna be a slightly lower quality image, however, it is still perfectly acceptable and used um, as, as an acceptable project. I, I've never got any complaints on having it set as that. And my, my system will crash less and it, it uploads easier. Um, and so that the, I just wanted to touch with that on you guys. And then uh, the last thing I wanted to explain to you is, you know, if you have to import company headers and things like that, um, you know, you, you are able to do that. Uh, you're, you're able to put, like if you, let's say, if every time you got a project from, say, Allstate, if every time you wanted to have that header on it, you could put it there. Otherwise, you won't have to do that. If every time you got a project from Allstate, you wanted it to have a Pennsylvania opening, then you could do that here, and it'll auto-save. You don't have to press save. If every time you wanted it to be your name as the claim rep, that means these are things you won't have to do when you download the project. Um, but so I wanted to touch on that. And then let's see here. Um, these are things that you can go in and change if you want to. Um, for instance, if you uh, if you always want it to be where um, you know it pays it pays ACV or overhead and profit is always added, that kind of thing, or depreciation is set to age and condition, you can you can certainly go ahead and and do that. But um, other than that, guys, um, you can adjust the size of doors. Um, you can you can set your um, every time you drop in a box for that box to um, uh, excuse me. Like, uh, let me explain what I mean by a box. If we go to calculations, so every time I set in a reference block, if I wanted to automatically remove linear area behind the block. Your guidelines are going to state whether they want this. Remove square feet area under the block. You can do it automatically. So, um, but we will discuss that further in depth. But I wanted you to at least see 
setting section and how it can be beneficial to go in here and make sure the walls are at four inches, make sure the ceiling height is at eight feet. Make sure if you if you don't have five foot windows, every time you press the window key to drop a window in, you're, you could be wasting time because it's at five feet. So you can change that here. Maybe you want it at two feet, 10 inches or something of like that. Maybe you only want it two, two and a half feet off the floor. Um, and that's able to be done here. Maybe, you know, um, your doors, you want them deducted. And so you're able to do all that right here in this area. Um, all right. So I think that's it for part one, everybody. Um, we did start a little bit later. And so um, we uh, basically finished, I think, just on time, maybe five minutes over. It's about an hour and five minutes. But today you should have been able to grasp, uh, we'll go back here, you should have been able to grasp a concept of you know, how to uh, navigate through the claims info tab. We will actually go into this again so we can show it. How to navigate through the claim info tab, which is right here. Should have been able to grasp that concept starting from the insured info, coverage and loss info, and parameters, and, and then um, how to install new profiles, right? We would talk to Exactware, and then how to adjust your settings. So, and that's all done here, and these are specific to profiles. I hope you found this Xactimate training insightful and valuable in expanding your adjuster toolkit. At Adjuster University, we are dedicated to empowering adjusters with the knowledge they need to succeed. If you have found this video helpful, we invite you to consider subscribing to our platform. By joining our community, you'll gain access to a rich library of training resources, expert tips, and engaging coaching calls like the one you just experienced. We are here to support your professional growth every step of the way. If you're interested in joining our thriving community, click subscribe on the screen, find it in the corner below, or the link in the video description. Thank you for investing your time. We're excited to be part of your journey and continuous learning and professional advancement. See you guys later.